Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Is Myanmar's army still killing people in Rakhine? Today, we discuss a new report by Amnesty International that accuses the military of fresh atrocities. Tweet us your comments or leave them in our live YouTube chat, and you too can be in the stream. The massacre of ethnic groups in Myanmar's Rakhine state hasn't ended, according to a new report by Amnesty International. Now the group wants the UN Security Council to refer the crimes to the International Criminal Court. Rakhine state is riven by ethnic and religious divisions and was the epicenter of the bloody military crackdown against Rohingya Muslims in 2017. Much of the continued violence, though, is between the Myanmar military and the Iraq army, a group of ethnic Rakhine rebels. A woman widowed following an attack in March wants both sides to lay down arms and talk. It's like both sides are too proud. Now my husband is dead. They wrapped up his body in plastic. They didn't even allow us to touch it. So what will it take to stop the bloodshed? We're here in our studio to discuss Matthew Wells. He's a senior at crisis advisor at Amnesty International and one of the researchers behind the Amnesty report. In Amsterdam, Anita Shug, she's head of Women and Children Affairs at the European Rohingya Council. And in Myanmar, Eileen McCarthy. She's an advocacy manager for Save the Children. Now, we won't be seeing Eileen during our discussion. That's because Save the Children asked us to protect her identity due to the sensitive nature of her work. Welcome to all of you. Good to have you here in the stream. So I'd like to start, of course, with this headline because it is such a, a strong, poignant headline from Amnesty International. Myanmar, no one can protect us. Of course, that's in quotes. War crimes and abuses in Myanmar's Rakhine state. Talk to us about the impetus behind this report, Matt. So in early January, the Arakan Army, which is an ethnic Rakhine armed group, a predominantly Buddhist uh, minority in Rakhine state, launched attacks on police posts. And after that, the military moved in a large number of troops into Rakhine state and have been carrying out intense operations since. And what we have seen is that the military has committed the same types of crimes that we at Amnesty and others have documented again and again and again. Arbitrary arrests, torture and other ill treatment. Uh, we documented summary executions. We documented indiscriminate attacks when they lob mortars or fire indiscriminately inside of a village. I interviewed a father of a seven-year-old boy. The military fired a mortar that landed right next to their home. Mm -hmm. It fired shrapnel into the boy. And to make matters worse, then the military blocked the father from getting the boy to medical care for several hours. The father was trying desperately to get him to a hospital. And he wasn't able to get permission from the soldiers for several hours to leave to get to a hospital. And the boy ultimately died the next day. Mm -hmm. And these are the types of crimes, again, that we have seen again and again by the military. And it speaks to the fact that despite all the tension there's been, for the atrocities against the Rohingya and elsewhere in the country, that the military fundamentally has not changed, that it still continues to commit the same crimes because it continues to operate above the law. Mm -hmm. Eileen, when you read the report and, and read about it, were you surprised? Did any of this strike you as shocking? I mean, I think the report really brings to light the issues that we've seen time and again in Myanmar, and it reiterates the reports that we've also been hearing about killing of children as a direct um, targeting and indirect actions, the mistreatment of children and detention of civilians, the use of schools for military purposes. I think what the report really brings to light is that these issues are happening again in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And we had a report last year from the fact-finding mission about this happening in, in Myanmar since 2011. That's when it was documented. And this is just another case in which we're seeing a huge impact of conflict on civilians. What do we know about the groups that are being targeted, the groups who are affected most about this? Because this isn't just the Rohingya. Uh, Anita, I'll direct this question to you and then, of course, get the view from Amnesty and from Matt. But your take on who's actually at the, who's being affected the most? I think now the fresh attacks which is happening um, since January 2019 between the Arakan army and the Myanmar military, of course, uh, the Rakhine, our sister Rakhine community is uh, affected. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the ones who are, uh, the, the remaining Rohingya are also severely affected because the, the, the fights which happens 
uh, are near the Rohingya villages. So like uh, the Rohingya community is also very severely affected, not only the Rakhine community. And uh, both the parties uh, are uh, combating near the Rohingya uh, villages. The uh, landmines are uh, planted near to the Rohingya villages. The f uh, gun shooting takes place uh, near the Rohingya villages. So uh, the Rohingyas are already very severely restricted uh, to freedom of move movement, uh, denied medical care. So all the injured, uh, injured ones, they are uh, not getting the proper medical care which they should be getting. Uh, few have uh, received medical care, but it's not on the cost of the government, mm -hmm. uh, nor uh, from the local uh, government. It's, uh, it's whoever can hardly manage some money. They are getting, uh, they are paying their, uh, their own services for the medical Medical care, mm -hmm. and uh, after a few days, you know, they are just uh, waiting uh, to die. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, our sisterly community is also equally being right. affected. Ma? Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the things that we're also seeing on the ground is the impact of communities across Rakhine State. Mm -hmm. And Save the Children works to to support communities across the across the state, um, and the impact of of restrictions and. Um, the blocking of humanitarian access for many UN agencies and INGOs like Save the Children has had a, a huge impact both on, on those directly affected by the current conflict, but then also um, the longer standing uh, services and assistance that was being provided to all communities in Rakhine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, they're both absolutely right. So we see abuses that are targeting all of the different ethnic minorities that live in Rakhine State, and that includes the Rohingya and also predominantly Buddhist minorities like the ethnic Rakhine, the ethnic Mro, the ethnic Kami. Mm -hmm. um, we've documented you know, arbitrary detention on a, on a large scale, particularly against ethnic Rakhine. Uh, younger men who were kind of seen by the military as part of the Arakan army, even when there's no, of course, direct link between them. It's just kind of this mass mm. suspicion of a community at large. And so oftentimes you have younger men being swept up and detained and then subjected to, to torture or other ill treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Anita said, the, the Rohingya who remain in Rakhine state um, are also being affected by the current conflict. On the 3rd of April, uh, the Myanmar military opened fire with a helicopter on Rohingya who were just collecting bamboo. Um, and the Rohingya have to get permission from the Myanmar authorities to get to that area to collect bamboo. So it should have been well known who these people were, that they were civilians just trying to meet their basic needs. Mm -hmm. And the military opened fire with missiles from a helicopter that killed at least six and injured many more. Um, and so again, this is something that is the military operations are affecting communities across the board in Rakhine State. I want to share with our audience what some of that uh, fighting sounds like from the vantage point of people who have the, uh, the wherewithal to leave if they want to. So take a look at this. This is back in March. Two British tourists visiting an ancient temple town were caught in the crossfire between the Iraqi army and the Myanmar military. Have a look. If you're wondering what that noise is outside, that's just the uh, Myanmar army just firing rifles and explosions and stuff. A load of soldiers at the top of this temple that we were going to go on. I thought they were statues, but then they all started moving like 20 of them on top of this little hill with their assault rifles. So, uh, yeah, we're running on bikes here as well. So it's not like we're going to be able to outrun a bullet or anything, but, uh, okay. Well, if this is the last video I ever post, uh, yeah, I should have thought about something to say. So if you were able to listen closely, you could hear the shots in the background. Now, they were able to make it to safety, but for so many actual residents, the story doesn't have such a safe ending. So it begs one question that a, a member of our community watching on YouTube has, and this is Dark Puzzle, who says, does anyone know the leader of the Myanmar army? Uh, Matt, I'll give this one to you. So the commander in chief, uh, his name is Min Online. Uh, he's been in charge for, for years of the Myanmar military. He was in charge during the atrocities against the Rohingya population. He's been in charge as the military has committed war crimes and other serious violations in the northern part of the country against ethnic Kachin and Ta'ong and Shan. Um, so the same person has been char in charge throughout this period. And it's why we and others have said that there need to be criminal investigations and ultimately prosecutions of the senior military leadership. And this isn't something about 
particular units that are bad apples and committing this. This is an institutional issue. Across the board, different units in the military are committing similar types of crimes, which is why we say, and, and others like the UN fact-finding mission have said, this goes to the top. And ultimately, these people need to be investigated and prosecuted. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to share uh, with all of our, our guests and our audience two headlines. So this from Reuters. This came out May 6th. You may remember it. Two Reuters reporters freed in Myanmar after more than 500 days in jail. That's 500 days. And you can see a video of the journalists being reunited with their families there as they walked free from prison. They were pardoned. Now, the next headline is this one, Myanmar soldiers jailed for Rohingya massacre, freed after months. And those are uh, some of the soldiers that were implicated in this report from Reuters, massacre in Myanmar's a Reuters special report. Uh, Eileen, when you look at this story, the journalists involved in uncovering this serve longer periods of time than the soldiers. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, I think as Matt has spoken to, um, this is an issue that unfortunately is not new to Myanmar. And despite the fact that the um, government has said that it's serious about taking accountability for the violations which may or may not have occurred and, and that the um, punishment that those soldiers faced was the first step towards taking responsibility and it set up um, a commission of inquiry the seriousness with, with which the government um, and the Myanmar authorities are taking accountability is not to the level that we would like to see. And I think that that's what this report from Amnesty and what we've seen from the fact-finding mission makes quite clear. Mm -hmm. So international crimes require an international response. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, we need to see action outside of Myanmar in order to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that for the populations who have experienced these massive violations and abuse, that they are able to receive justice for, for those crimes. Anita? Yes, I would like to add some certain points here. You know, like the ju judicial system in Myanmar is not independent. The military is above the law. So um, here, the prisoning of the uh, soldiers who were involved in the killing of the innocent Rohingya civilians, unarmed innocent Rohingya civilians, they were not supposed to be sent to the jail. It was because of the international outcry that these soldiers were put inside the jail. And uh, the release of the two uh, Reuters journalists, it was, not, uh, their, it was not a crime that they reported. You know, it was not... An, um, uh, they didn't commit any crime, and their clear case has not been cleared. So it was a, a presidential pardon, which means they are still accused of the c committing a crime, but they were pardoned. So you see, uh, the Myanmar government is very much capable of doing anything it pleases, but it lacks accountability. The judicial system is uh, not independent, and the civilian government itself is not capable of providing um, uh, accountability to the civilians, and especially Aung San Suu Kyi, because after the release of the uh, Reuters journalist, she was heard saying that, uh, that these uh, two journalists were guilty of committing a state crime. Mm. And that doves well with this tweet from H.G. Flores, who says none of that will change everything that you just laid out there without external pressure from trading partners and internal pressure from cultural leaders. So we got a video comment from someone who says something very similar uh, in that there needs to be outside pressure. This is Ronan Lee. He's a visiting scholar at Queen Mary University of London. And here's what he told the stream. Myanmar's military do not care about the well-being of civilians. We've seen that in how they've mistreated the Rohingya and they are going to continue to mistreat civilians until they're stopped. It's time the international community did more than provide food and humanitarian aid after the fact. It's time now that there were peacekeepers on the ground. So he's calling for peacekeepers. He's not the only one. This is Sir uh, P on uh, Twitter who says peacekeeping mission will help to protect the Rohingya people and, of course, others with the peacekeeping mission and will show uh, those people a sense of belonging and it will restore hope. Amnesty is calling for this to be referred, of course, to the ICC. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that will go and is that even feasible? I mean, 
as, as has been said by others, change is not going to come from the Myanmar military itself. This has to come from pressure from outside. And the international community has really failed in its responsibility uh, to respond to crimes of the magnitude that we're talking about. I mean, the UN fact-finding mission has said that the senior military leadership should be investigated and prosecuted for genocide. And yet there has been next to no response from the international community, no Security Council resolution. Um, we have to see a referral to the International Criminal Court so that the full range of crimes committed by the military over the last eight years can be investigated. We should also see a comprehensive arms embargo on the Myanmar military to make sure that they can't keep acquiring weapons that are being used to harm civilians in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to make sure that investigators can get on the ground to the sites in Rakhine State and in northern Myanmar as well where crimes have been committed. Both the military and the civilian authorities in Myanmar continue to block independent access to these areas, just as they continue to block humanitarian access in order to deliver life-saving assistance to people. And so we need to see far more pressure from the international community to get aid access, to get access to independent investigators, and ultimately to investigate and prosecute those responsible. And pressure is the number one word. I want to share this from Emmanuel on Twitter who says, I would prefer the world put pressure for a long-term solution in discussion with the governments. And of course, that discussion would involve Aung San Suu Kyi, Myanmar's state councillor. I saw you trying to jump in there, Anita. What did you want to add? You know, like, um, if you see the fact-finding mission, they, they came up with their report more than one and a half years ago with their final report and their recommendation. There was a Kofi Annan Commission's final report and recommendations. How many reports are we going to put up? How many investigations are we going to uh, put up and look forward for? We are, uh, our, our patients, the, the patients of the Rohingyas are being tested time again and again. And I think it's not only the, uh, the Myanmar military or the uh, civilian government which are responsible for the crimes which is happening or the killing field which is uh, taking place inside Myanmar, but also all the uh, policymakers, the, our uh, politicians, world leaders, they are equally responsible because they were alarming signs which has which has been taking place. We Rohingyas have been signaling the alarming signs from 2012, from 78, from 1991, 92, and now also we 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 said there is a genocide, and the um, um, fact-finding mission did say it is genocide with through the expertise. Mm -hmm. So uh, how many how many investigations, how many reports are we going to pu push for? Mm -hmm. And also at the Security Council, you know, Security Council is built to protect and prevent crimes like genocide. And when there is a genocide already said by the UN fact-finding mission, the Security Council is not in a position to protect the most vulnerable population, and that is the Rohingya. And it's, it's because of their in action, uh, incapable actions or lip services now, not only the Rohingyas are being attacked, <laughs> there are our um, sister community, there are Chinese also, also being agree. attacked, you know? I it is, you know, I like, it is, yeah. I, just, I, I hear Eileen trying to, try, trying to jump in. So, uh, Anita, let's hear what Eileen wants to add. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I completely agree that we have seen time and again that this is not a unique instance. And I think in, as it relates to a long-term solution, as you mentioned, Anita, there is the Rakhine Advisory Commission recommendations from Kofi Annan, which were released and the government committed to just hours before the events took place in August of 2017 and making sure that there's meaningful action towards implementation of all of the recommendations, including those that are related to human rights. Um, we, have a, we have a framework for a solution or progress in Rakhine State, and it's incumbent that we, as an international community, are able to present a united message in order to ensure that there's accountability as well as progress on the ground in Rakhine for all communities. Mm. And as you mentioned, we have reports that are very strong on this, and. I think it's it's up to us as, as the international community to make sure that we're actually moving forward. But Eileen, in the midst of all of this, though, are headlines like this. This is from UNICEF. Myanmar calls for the urgent, UNICEF Myanmar calls for the urgent protection of children in Rakhine State as schools reopen soon. Between January and April 2019, two children were killed and two others injured. And this came out just a few days ago. So I know that you are working with communities that are most at risk here with, with the idea of school opening soon. What is that like for people who are going through this and who still have so much uncertainty? Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of the things that we're really worried about. As the rainy season is approaching and the school year starting, the impact of this conflict on civilians is going to become that much more dire. And especially as humanitarian access continues to be extremely restricted, we're not actually able to meet the immediate needs. And while the government has committed to 
addressing the needs of these newly displaced communities. Um, we know that there are needs out there and that we are there to help to support. And I think that it's one of the most important things to make sure that we are able to be on the ground and make sure that children are able to get back into school just like they would if they were at home and make sure that their immediate needs, but then also that importance of their long-term education is really prioritized. Conflict impacts children's lives, both in the short term and in the long term. And as humanitarian actors, we can play a role in helping to mitigate that impact, but only if we're able to help to support them. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a desire to, to help support, um, but need to be able to have the access to do so. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we document in our report and that comes out of that UNICEF release as well is that the military is often actually using schools as barracks. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen this both in Rakhine State right now and also uh, in northern Myanmar, where they, they often you know, set up shop for, for days at a time in schools as they're carrying out operations in the area. And that obviously puts children at risk right. um, if that continues as we, as we enter the school year. And so again, more pressure is needed to make sure that the military in particular stops using schools as barracks. And that that's uh, likely partly one of the reasons we got this tweet from Edward who heard what you just said and said, I heard the amnesty rep call for an arms embargo. Let's hear more about that, please. Arms embargo has been missing from the conversation. We need to follow the money. So there's one take there on Twitter. But I want to turn to this next one. This is from Toon Kin, and he says, I've been receiving reports that two Rohingya have been killed and eight injured in clashes between the military and the Iraq and army in a village. How can anyone say it is safe for our people to return home when those that remain have to run for their lives? And of course, there are several ethnic groups that are being affected right now. But when we hear about the Rohingya and know what happened from 2017 and, and remember the reporting around that, Anita, talk to us about where some of those communities are now, especially because the idea of repatriation keeps coming back up. Um, you know, like um, many of the uh, Rohingyas, you know, uh, if you're talking about the inside Burma, uh, many Rohingyas are internally displaced after these recent clashes between AA and uh, Myanmar army. So uh, people cannot r return to their original places because they are really scared of their lives. So, so they are somewhere displaced without any shelter. And when you talk about the uh, um, forcefully dis uh, deported uh, Rohingya in uh, Bangladesh, you know, uh, these people have uh, nowhere to go. And uh, because they are also inside Bangladesh, they are also uh, not allowed to, to, have, to enjoy any freedom of movement because they're not allowed to go out of the camps. So I, I uh, don't see any, any future for them inside uh, Burma because there's still fresh clashes uh, happening. The genocide of the Rohingya is happening. The war crimes is still taking place. And there will be more, um, uh, what do you call, more um, things coming up because, you know, you have to keep one thing in mind. 2020 is the election time. Mm -hmm. So military wants to take uh, again uh, to win the election. So there will be some trap or some process in making to get rid of the whole uh, remaining Rohingya community. So um, I don't think so. The, the, it is very premature to talk about repatriation. You know, there are still IDP people from 2012, and they're still not allowed to go back to their original homes. So I don't think so. They, they, it is um, it is uh, wise to talk mm -hmm. about repatriation because the lives of right. the Rohingya are not safe inside Burma. Matt, you're nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, I think just to pick up on on two key things. One, just as she's saying, I mean, there for the Rohingya who remain in Rakhine State, there is still no freedom of, of movement. There is no ability for them to move around to undertake the most basic functions in terms of going to collect firewood, going to the the streams to fish. Um, their access to move around is restricted completely. Um, you also still don't have the fundamental question of of nationality, of citizenship being addressed by the Myanmar government, who continues to deny that they are part of Myanmar, despite what we all know. And in addition to that, you have that, um, in addition to the conflict that's, that's taking place right now, that of course also makes it more difficult to return, you have the fact that Myanmar has often constructed new things on top of what used to be Rohingya villages. Wow. We've reported this, others have reported this as well, based on satellite imagery that shows, for example, villages that were burned, then bulldozed, and then after that the, mil the military or the government more generally has built new border guard police bases, has built homes for people from other ethnic minorities to live in. And so they've in fact made it impossible for many Rohingya 
Rohingya to return back to the villages where they were from. Matt, you're telling us a tragic story. Unfortunately, I have to pause the conversation there. Of course, this is one that we will come back to. A thank you to our guests and, of course, our community for joining us. But just enough time to tell you about Tuesday's show. Against the backdrop of the Women Deliver Conference underway in Vancouver, I'll be joined by some of the world's most influential women leading the charge for gender equality. You can see them on my screen there. We'll be live with me in the stream. Melinda Gates, Julia Gillard, and Winnie Bayanima. Do you have questions or comments for them? Tweet me at AJStream. We'll see you online.